Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. This is the Gold Spot Dow Jones 30 Cross. And I brought this chart up because if you followed me on the last few videos, you know that I'm uh, in my little paper account. And again, that's a little tiny paper account that I'm playing with. I have gone long the AGQ and I'm short certain stocks. I'm not going to name those stocks because, of course, that's going to subject me to uh, potentially being uh, getting in trouble for front running my own trade. So I'm not going to mention those, but uh, everyone knows that I'm long the metals. So this chart is showing some very interesting divergence. Uh, I've lined out the places where we had the divergence where we had the gold price going down and the Dow price going up there aren't too many of these the biggest ones are going to be here and here you can see that they ultimately resolve themselves to a, a, a downdraft in one or the other this one is going to be unique because this is actually the 1900 print it actually was 1922 or so for gold and uh, and then you can see we got a crash in gold and a rally in the Dow. The one we're on right now is uh, a little bit strange because it's the biggest divergence we've had with paper going up and real uh, assets going down. Of course, that is paper gold, but still, that's a very large divergence. You can see that the Dow is trading the equivalent of 1900 gold while gold is trading the equivalent of 12,000 Dow. So it's my expectation that this will probably close in the same way that the last ones closed, but I can't say how that's going to be. I don't know if that's going to be a tremendous drop in the paper Dow, or that's going to be a tremendous rise in the paper gold, or it's just going to be uh, a meeting of both so we'll have to wait and see how that uh, turns out I do believe firmly that uh, at some point we're going to see a one for one Dow and gold price now uh, that could be 20,000 on the Dow and 20,000 on gold that could be a thousand on the Dow and a thousand on gold I don't know where that's going to take place I don't know how that's going to take place but I do firmly believe that that's going to happen so let's take a look at the silver price we did have more significant volume come in today uh, let's get to a closer scale the 30 minute that was the one we were looking at actually let's push out to an hour here and you can see we didn't get the type of spike we saw uh, yesterday but uh, you have to remember that when you're looking at these rounding uh, bottom type formations uh, it, it depends on the perspective you have so uh, at this granular level you can see that million spike there and then we did about a little over 400,000 if we pull out a little bit more then it's gonna move those closer together and you're gonna see uh, that type of bottom spike let's pull out to the four hour and see how that shapes up so uh, that's a very large volume spike you can see the only rival to that spike is going to be this one all the way back in August and uh, that's just one spike we have a double spike here so uh, it could be the bottom I can't say for sure uh, we'll pull up the net Dania MACD and uh, you can see we have that cross we do have a cross it's not as oversold as we were uh, in the end of December and uh, that is a kind of divergence that you sometimes see in markets that are turning around so it's possible that this divergence is indicating uh, that we're gonna rally but again we don't know uh, the best thing we can do is just stack so I wanted to get over to some of the stuff I've been uh, doing and covering and let's jump over to Atmax first of all this is the coin that I bought it uh, recently uh, it's a little bit expensive for those who uh, are 
not interested in paying a significant amount above spot. This one's $4.99 above spot. Now there's a couple of reasons why I decided to get this coin. You can see on the singles they have $4.49 left, but they also have rolls of 20 and rolls of 100. So there's a lot of these left. I think there's about 3,000. So I don't expect them to disappear quickly. But I really like this coin, first of all, because the 2012 uh, Kookaburra on just the regular year is uh, already going for, I think, 45 or something on Atmex. This one you can still get for around 33 And the other thing I like, it has that it, it's the Dragon Privy. Uh, they've decided to stamp this one with the Chinese Dragon. It also is limited to a mint of 80,000 coins. So there's just a lot of reasons I like this coin, and uh, so I just wanted to cover that. Now, another coin that I had bought in the past, I've actually bought this coin three times. I'm kind of following this one down. That's the 2012 half ounce Lunar Ear of the Dragon. You can see that they're actually shipping this one out March 15th, and uh, I don't know the uh, reason why that is and I would love to have my viewers in Australia clarify that for me now I did have one viewer tell me and I can't verify this so if anyone knows please answer this question the uh, what I heard is that uh, it's not actually possible for anybody outside of Australia to directly source these from the Perth Mint it requires an Australian citizen to buy them first and export them. So is that why we have these coins at 1687? You can see that's the equivalent of about a 33 something price. So uh, for me, that's a pretty good deal considering we're at about uh, about 20, 29, close to 29, about four above spot. So I really like these Chinese related coins and uh, the extra reason I like these is because I think that as the ch uh, Chinese economy rises to in my opinion to become the next world power uh, there's going to be a, a very large demand from the Chinese we're talking a billion plus people and we're talking a very very tiny amount of coins so uh, I love the Perth Mint I love the fact that their coins are in uh, plastic every coin is sealed in plastic uh, potentially every coin could be a numismatic play because uh, you could go ahead and get those graded you might have an ms70 coin so there's a lot of reasons why i like the perth mint and uh, those are the two that i'm looking at i don't have a lot of dry powder left on this but uh, then again i don't really think we're going much lower and I could be wrong if you remember uh, when I saw the volume uh, we'll go in a little closer here when I saw this volume here and actually the line was pretty steep when I drew the volume but you can see that the volume has actually gone exponential on this so is it a bottom I don't know uh, but we'll see the line that we're watching very very carefully here is going to be this 2930 line and if we draw this close in one you can see we've just broken out and uh, that may be marking the bottom but again I can't say because uh, I don't know the future I'm just guessing at these things your guess is as good as mine so let's go over to some questions of the night I'm just gonna go through them one by one I haven't gone through these so I'm just gonna try to knock a few of these out this is from German Stacker Cancelled Debt. Dear Brother John, I'm following your channel for quite some time now. I've decided to invest a nice amount into physical gold and silver. Apparently too early looking at current prices. However, good timing has always been difficult. There is one idea related to the increasing debt levels worldwide I've been thinking about for quite some while. What would happen if central banks would simply cancel governmental debt they bought? Debt levels would come down substantially and the private sector wouldn't be hit. If this could be a realistic option for the central banks, the long-term equation, more money printing, higher PM prices might 
not be correct. Any thoughts? Best regards from Germany. Thanks for all your efforts. Well, the main thing you have to keep in mind is that the debt that is held is a, a debt that has a counterparty. So it, we may have very, very low interest rates as the Fed pushes them down and continues to push interest rates down and try to force people into stocks and other investments. But you have to remember that if you evaporate these debts, you also evaporate the counterparties. Now that's really important because we're seeing in the Western world, in Europe, America, and Japan, a very, very large number of retirees. Uh, and those people are dependent upon the counterparty risk. So it, yes, it would be good probably for the upcoming generations, but it could be very, very bad for the generations who are dependent upon being supported by these upcoming generations. So uh, the Fed, the Treasury, the government, the Congress, the President, they're all between a rock and a hard place because uh, I'm sure they all would like to free up the next generation to not be burdened with this debt. But then again, they've already made promises to the retiring generation and uh, those, uh, those monies that supposedly were saved have actually already been spent. So they've painted themselves into a corner because they made promises they can't keep. And I think the big issue is going to be who is going to uh, be defaulted on? Is it going to be the seniors who are not going to get uh, the money they were promised? Or are we going to enslave the younger generation to make sure those promises are paid? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, next question, where am I wrong from Dave606? Tell me where my reasoning is flawed. I do not see silver sustaining a price above something in the 20s for quite some time unless we have a complete collapse of the dollar or a major shortage. Silver has been meeting all demand and only a few years ago sold above $18 an ounce. If silver is obtained mostly as a byproduct, then the mining cost is zero. Well, that's just plain silly to say that. The only cost is refining. I saw a video not long ago with the owner of a mine that was very happy with a price in the high 20s. If all silver demand was met at under $18 an ounce until three years ago, what will drive it above the 20s now other than the collapse or shortage stated earlier? Thanks for the time devoted to educating us on the metals and markets. Well, uh, this statement about the mining cost being zero, uh, that's a very important statement because uh, it's very difficult to calculate the mining cost of silver. And that's, again, because it's a byproduct. But again, as Jeff Nielsen has pointed out, the reason that it's a byproduct is because its price is suppressed to be so low that it's not the primary metal that's coming out of those mines. Now, that doesn't mean that it's being mined for free. <laughs> that uh, just means that it's a byproduct. And uh, as to how those calculations are made, no one knows. But we do know, as I've shown in the last uh, few videos, that the uh, primary silver miners and even some of the secondary silver miners, they're not faring too well and uh, so you have to look at the overall finances of the companies that are doing the mining. It's not so simple as to say that uh, they're just mining copper and the silver is free. And next question is from Four Nines. And this is a long one, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll just read the end here. Do you think we have to wait for the biblical outcome or can you envision a plausible intermediate scenario to allow for an orderly upward price movement in silver? Can't say enough good things about your tireless work to create equity for those who need it most. So go ahead and read the whole question yourself. But uh, uh, biblical outcome, I guess what that term is referring to is an end of the world scenario. That's a 
one of those that a lot of the critics of the silver stackers come up with. And again, I pointed this out many, many times. I believe the most bullish scenario for silver is actually growth. And uh, it, it, silver stackers are not necessarily uh, end of the world type people. Uh, I certainly don't want to see uh, a collapse with uh, rioting in the streets and uh, people begging for bread and anything like that. I, I would love to see an ordered transition to a new monetary system and to see uh, silver revalued uh, to, to its true value as a monetary and uh, uh, industrial asset and uh, see a smooth and peaceful transition. So I don't see that scenario necessarily playing out uh, I think it's in my opinion that we're looking at a rise and fall of certain empires in the world and that silver is going to be key in that but uh, certainly I don't think anyone should be uh, wishing or looking for the end of the world scenario. Uh, I'm certainly not looking for that. And uh, we'll take one more question and that is silver prices to crash due to correction in open interest. This is Illini 825 Hi, Brother John. I still believe in the long-term fundamentals of physical gold and silver. However, an interesting video from Monetary Metals makes the observation that a downward price of silver is coming due to an increasing abundance of silver in comparison to gold based on increasing basis points. Also, he notes how the open interest of silver is at a comparable high compared to 2011 when silver hit close to $50 and then collapsed down to 20s. What are your thoughts on this analysis? So I'm not going to click on that link. Uh, you can follow that yourself and, and look at that. But uh, I covered this a little bit last night. Open interest just simply means uh, the number of contracts that are out there they don't count them twice they just count one side so open interest is a very difficult uh, statistic to analyze in the futures markets uh, there's a lot of people who have made speculation as to whether uh, rising open interest means one thing is bullish a uh, falling open interest and you have to calculate the price moves with the moves in open interest uh, but open interest essentially means the number of people who have a position in a particular commodity now I think that the open interest in silver is definitely outsized and the reason it's outsized of course is because of the manipulators who are involved in the silver game. Uh, the open interest is simply the number of contracts that are outstanding and to short silver to uh, manipulate the price of silver uh, to go short and to punish the price it requires a larger open interest uh, because uh, that are that's a number of short contracts that are required so it doesn't mean that uh, silver is going down or silver is going up it's a battle between paper shorts and paper longs and uh, how many people are willing to take the other side now it's my contention when we look at the volume information for silver that uh, it it's my guess I'm just guessing I don't know but I will say from this chart uh, that there appears to be a body or a group of people who are actually willing to take uh, the silver long position in the paper now I can't speculate as to who that is it may be Chinese interests it may be hedge funds, it may be pension funds, it may just be a billionaire or two. We don't know, but uh, when I look at this chart, uh, I see a rising price accompanied by a spike bottom volume. And that tells me that when we had the massive sell-off uh, that was a, definitely a coordinated Fed sell-off, that at some point it met a very 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 large buying interest who was willing to bet a very large amount of money that they could not push the paper price 
any lower than this and uh, I said at this point that I thought we'd reached the bottom and I'm going to say at this point I think we've reached the bottom uh, again I said I'm long the AGQs at this point uh, I could be wrong we could actually go to 5 or 10 million volume on the paper silver and uh, that would again end up being the biggest bottom anyone's ever seen because you can see the level of these so I'm going to stick by that call I think that this is probably a intermediate term bottom I can't say we're going to run straight to 50 or 100 from here but uh, I think it's a very good place to stack and we'll talk to you next time